it's going to be a no laptop day. Sorry, and you are welcome. Please put away your laptops. If you want to leave, you can leave. But you will be asked. Well, today's a good lecture. Lots of stuff. How long do you have to stay for your presentation? Um, technically, if you leave, if you arrive um, more than uh, 10 minutes after the uh, start, then you're absent. If you leave more than 10 minutes before the end, you're absent. So you can go out. For nine minutes, they come back. Yeah, then you have to stay all the way to the end. Oh, it's like you only get the You only get, get a 10 minute allowance. Okay, that's really the wow. So are you. Are you taking notes? Are you taking notes? Uh, on your laptop? Uh, is your Rhino model? Uh, is your Rhino app closed? Like, okay. um, as long as there is no architect, no studio related anything open on your laptop. And it's gotten to the point where we actually have to check. We have to treat you like uh, less than the respect that you deserve because uh, it's been abused so egregiously that we just can't, just can't do this. So, so while I'm lecturing, Professor Cardona will be checking to make sure that there's no studio work. And he's lecturing, I will be checking. Questions about that? So we have a lot to do and not much time to do it in. Um, okay. So today's topic is about race. Um, but before we get into that, um, there's uh, we're one third of the way through the semester, believe it or not. Uh, maybe that's a great thing, maybe it's not so great. Um, but people are starting, there's a pattern of people making the same mistake week after week. What we want to encourage you to do is to have a buddy, share your analysis with your buddy before you submit. So who's your buddy? Are you sitting next to your buddies? So uh, make sure that your buddy looks at what you're doing. Because there's a good chance that you're making a different set of mistakes than your buddy is making. One of the most common mistakes is, I don't know why you, but do you are using citation generators online? Do you do that? Purdue Owl. <laughs> Purdue Owl. And you just say, Purdue Owl, give me a citation? No. What do you do? They tell you what you need and you fill it in. Are you getting it right or are you losing points? I have no idea. We very... spend all this time giving feedback. You spend all day Wednesday. Yeah. It's very confusing. So if you're losing points on completeness, it's probably one of the most common things is your, instead of giving us a note citation formatted footnote and issue source, you're giving us a bibliography. This is the bibliography form. We show it to you to make sure you understand that it's different from the note citation format. We never ask you for the bibliography form until the term project. Yeah, which is the common out of from. Uh, oh, yeah, citation generators will give you the bibliography format. You'll use it week after week. We'll take away the points week after week. It's just depressing. Yeah, but in, I do not remember the page again, but if you, if, so commonly, if you have an issue with the citation, we browse specifically. Please review the citation. 
Yeah. This is not in the feedback, you have no feedback. Use the note citation format for your footnote and your image source. You know it's the note citation format because it has lots of commas. It looks a little bit like a sentence. It has commas in the middle and a period at the end. The bibliography format is when you have an alphabetized list by author last name and lots of periods. It looks like a paragraph. Right? So friends don't let friends make that mistake over and over again. Please share your work with your friend and give your friend a chance to stop the madness. Questions about that? The other most common mistake is students are saying this project was produced in this year and it has this thing and that thing and they did this, period. That is a report of information. They may let you do it in studio. Do you let them do that in studio? The report of information, that's fine. You did it all through high school, that's fine. You, you mastered it, you're really good at it. Congratulations, that's how you got to work with. Now don't do that for this assignment. That is not what we're asking for in this assignment. This is an analysis. It's a different kind of writing. It's interpreting. So in this assignment, your sentence should go something like this. This railing in the front of the auditorium with its wood, stage wood, I'm describing it so far. But then I interpret it. What does it do? It characterizes it allows the lecturer to lean in to make certain points, right? So that's, a, that's an interpretive sentence. This architectural thing, strong action verb, characterized the impact for the user. So that's that type of sentence. And this is not English class. We want to focus on the content. But in order to do that, you have to write this type of, you have to engage in this type of writing. Can you get a uh, chat GPT to write like that? I doubt it. They'll give you lots of descriptive stuff and you'll lose points on it, but at least it'll be fast. Um, so that's not the kind of writing we're looking for. Any questions about this? Yes. Yes. Is that not quite enough for that? And I'm just trying to figure out where to put the writing. If you're looking at the paper one we gave you, we yeah. apologize. We've altered it as issues have come up. Okay. So if you look at number five, insert number five, it says insert your work into the Google Slides file or your section as follows. Insert the final image, right? Got it. Identify the work shown in the upper text box using this guide. Capture the ideas in the lower text box. Insert the paragraph footnote citation image source in the speaker notes. Yeah, that's not my issue. It's the actual submission of the Like the Google slide has my paragraph, has my image source, it has my actual source in the speaker notes. Yeah, perfect. perfect. But she's asking for in addition to that one, these submitted in Brightspace. So okay. I got points to come. I also got taken off. Oh, do we want that submitted in Brightspace? We just got the yeah, I don't know, I don't remember. Oh, that's that's my mistake. Just I yeah, I changed the instructions it's, so it's just the movie. Okay. It just okay, yeah. Yeah. all right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I submitted that though. I got I think it's useful to have the text in Brightspace as well. Okay. Because we can check out, check with authority. Oh, that's right. Okay. 
So um, we'll return those lost points. I will, yeah. Um, do you want an email from people who... Can you write in my email, remember? Yeah. And, and hey, um, send me an email about having a meeting. I, I would love to have a meeting with you about your papers. If you can send me an email, I can correct it. Right. Yeah. But in the future, I think it's useful to have a PDF with a text as well. So we'll send this out on WhatsApp chat group. This is a new change. Um, from now on, everyone should upload both an MP3, MP4 file and PDFs. Okay, questions. Thank you so much for clearing that up. You're wrong. So actually, so just a further clear up. So if we're putting the text on gray space, are we putting like all of the text that's on the slide or just to speak your notes? It should it should look like this in the end. The image on the slide should identify the work that's shown and then capture the key idea in a fragment. We do that on Brightspace too. <laughs> the PDF on Brightspace, uh, is a PDF on Brightspace, but in Google Slides, this is the slide, and this is in the speaker notes. So the PDF to do, you basically copy the slides, and you put a, a text, and you write the text, okay. and you have to submit that to the PDF. Right. So this is in the speaker notes without the color coding. The color coding is just to help you understand what each of these elements is. Yes, Jake. Do you think you possibly get a better grade if we color coded our paragraphs? So that no. we're on the same page. It, it might help you and your body. It's not my budget. Who's your body? He's not here today. Oh, what's his name? Uh, so so Jonathan, Jonathan might appreciate that. Because it might speed it up and it might help you keep track of what each sentence is doing. Writing works, it's easier to write when there's a clear purpose for every sentence. And that's uh, that's part of thinking well. If there's a reason why you're saying something in a meeting, it's gonna go better. Other questions? I have been like sharing PDFs with like the text. I kind of just put it together like street theory style with like image, caption, paragraph, and footnote. I'm just wondering if that's like what you want us to like format the PDF with the text, like, like for example, like this, but like, like this. Yeah. Yeah, it should. This, this is what we're hoping for. If you continue following the prior instructions, I don't think we're taking points off for that because it, it's got the same information. Yeah. It's just we're trying to simplify it and make it clearer. Um, when we were in history theory two, we were submitting Google Doc stuff. Here it's in Google Slides. We want it to make sense as a slide deck. It's no longer a Google Doc. The old formatting was left over from the Google Doc when we were doing Google Doc. Other questions? Oh, wait. Nash, you had a question. Okay. Other questions about how to stop losing the same points for the same mistakes week after week? So the main thing is, before you submit it, show it to a friend. Friends don't let friends get the footnote wrong week after week. Friends don't let friends get the paragraph wrong week after week, et cetera. We're good on with the show. Okay, do we have, um, we, we extracted a few questions from your excellent, oh wait, there's something else. They're probably not here. Um, you know, so tell Jonathan and tell whoever's not here that there's a minimum attendance policy. You don't want to be back here taking this class again next summer. So heads up, tell your friends. Friends don't let friends uh, fail the course for attendance. Friends don't let friends fail the course for lack of submissions. Minimum acceptable 
uh, submission rate is 70%. For those of you who came in late, uh, if, you're, if there's nothing open on your laptop related to studio, maybe you can keep it open. But if there's any app that's open on your laptop related to studio, you need to shut it down now or we will ask you to leave and you will be absent for today. We just, there's been too much uh, abuse of the privilege of having the laptops out. Okay. All right. So, how many of you feel like you're in control of your fate? Like the things that I do will make a difference in my lifetime, whether I succeed with it. Who's in control of their own fate? Okay. And this is a very binary question. How many, raise, please raise your hand if you feel like you are, uh, you're so constrained and so controlled that there's really nothing you can do just being washed down the street by just larger forces. There's really nothing. Um, how many feel like it's a combination? Fair enough. So, um, so it's something to think about. To what extent uh, are we? To what extent are there forces structuring the decisions that we have available to us to make? And to what extent are we able to make decisions, work hard, apply ourselves, and succeed based on our own uh, actions and behaviors? So this is a, a life, this is, philosophers have been thinking about this for thousands of years, and it's become a central topic in the discipline of architecture. To what extent uh, in the discipline of architecture are there structures that predetermine the outcomes? And to what extent can individuals do things within that structure to alter where they end up, right? And it turns out that you, we take a class called structures. We build structures, we design structures. Structures is what we do, and it's not just a metaphor. When I want to uh, rush out to the bathroom, you know, it's, if, even if it's this way, I can't go there. My, behavior is limited and constrained by the structure of the architecture. I have four doors to choose from, but I can't go out this way. So there are structural constraints on my agency. This is true uh, in our life circumstances. And something, we're gonna do a quick exercise because we don't have time, it's gonna be quick. But think of your grandparents. What year were your grandparents born? <clears throat> like 45? <clears throat> well, think about it. You, when your grandparents were born, they were something like 80 to 100% uh, likely to make more money than their parents. We have to have greater household income and greater wealth. And those are two different things that we're going to talk about today. And your parents, by the time, but by the time your parents came along, their chances of making more money than your grandparents were, were less, something like 60%. Okay. When were your parents born? 81? 81. Um, so where does that leave you? How likely are you to be uh, to end up with household income greater than your parents' household income? Raise your hand if you think 
you're likely to have a household income that ends up being greater than your parents' household. That's a possibility. How many raise now? Raise your hand if you uh, if you believe your household income will never surpass that of your parents. All right. That's fairly realistic. It turns out that uh, as time goes by, there's a reason why the prospects for improving are, are dropping. One is that your grandparents were so successful with their wealth. Your, grand, your parents were so successful in building wealth. And this is the, uh, the relationship between economic productivity and uh, the income and wealth of the top 10% related to everyone else. So this explains a lot about what's going on in the world right now. Yes, sir. Is this like with or without expenses and stuff like that? Are you saying that we want to take home or the last of the other or just in general? So that's a great point. Um, this is uh, income which is not the best measure. Most of what we're going to talk about during this lecture has to do with wealth, because that's where the, the architecture and the urbanism hits the road. So it's an excellent point. Income is increasingly meaningless um, in, because expenses are going up so, so fast. And the, the more, the darker things get, in terms of the likelihood of social mobility, the more likely we are to believe in the bootstrap story of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And with hard work and determination, you can do anything. You can be anyone you want to be. I am Rob Weish. I'm the Secretary of Labor of the Bill Before that, I'm the Carter Administration. Before that, I was a special agent of paper uh, Of all developed nations, the United States has the most unequal distribution of income, with sturdy or even greater income. <laughs> 1928 to 2007 become the peak years for income concentration. It looks like a suspension bridge. The answer is United States. In the decades after World War II, the planning boom, you had very low inequality. So, um, Robert Reich has done a, a great deal of work on uncovering uh, the, the prospects, the changing prospects of, of generation upon generation in the United States, and uh, why it's, it has happened the way it's happened. And his films, his videos, uh, in his writings, his books, are actually very useful for us to grasp what it is that is causing this. The good news is, that the bad news is that architects are part of the problem. The good news is because architects are part of the problem, we actually are part of the solution. So uh, it's a very exciting time to be entering the field of architecture because uh, there's a collective understanding of there is a lot of work for us to do. And the work we must do has to do with identifying those points of entry that actually can change the prospects and reduce inequality. So I, we gathered some of the questions coming out of the discussion over there. And housing is a major part of it. The design of our cities is a major part of it. The distribution, the spatial distribution of urban amenities housing costs, all of these things are very much part of it. And we benefit a great deal from looking at other countries because they have found ways to spread the wealth, literally, how to spread the wealth without taking it away from some people and giving it to others.
And you're going to talk about spatial opportunity next time? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll skip that. So how many of you are going to own your own home at some point? How many of you are not going to own your own home? Let's say 20 years from now. 20 years from now, will you own your own home? A houseboat counts. That actually might be a smart way to do it. So um, let's make this personal. So this is the life coaching part. How much money are you going to make when you graduate? 60,000? The went with average is 65, but the engineers are paid more than architects are. So you're probably going to earn something like 55. This, this data is a little out of date. Sorry about that. How much more money will you make as an architect? Let's say it's 55,000 is what graduates of the four-year program make. If you go one more year and spend that fifty, sixty thousand dollars to do the one year of graduate school, how much more money are you going to make a year? Six hundred dollars is correct. What are your student loans going to be? Are they federal student loans or are they from other sources? Well, the good news about the federal student loans, they're deeply subsidized already. And depending on how the election goes in November, there's a good chance that they will be forgiven. I'm, I think you should vote. That's, that's where I'm going to go, vote. So if your student loan debt is $80,000, which is about the average, how much are you going to pay a month uh, for those student loans? <laughs> And if you marry someone or you partner with someone who's making a similar similar amount to you, what is your household income going to be? And how much of a house can you afford? The guidelines for mortgage lending say that 30% of your monthly after-tax income should be dedicated to your housing costs no more. You can afford, the, you, the bank will, look at your monthly household income and expenses, and they will say, you qualify for a mortgage of fill in the blank. It depends on how many, what your student loan payments are. So we're going through this fast, but the slides are available. Uh, before you graduate and decide to go to the graduate program, before you, I mean, uh, 10 years from now, when you are sitting down with your partner trying to figure out whether to keep renting, uh, where to live, uh, this is available to you. So if you can, so this is just, a, a, this is two years old and the data is even older because they don't update these things very well for us. But if you can, let's say you can afford a house that's $500,000, where can you buy a house for $500,000? You can't afford to live in the red zones you cannot afford to live in the yellow zones, uh, the orange zones. Uh, the green zones are where you might be able to find a place to live. Who's going to have children? <laughs> um, to what extent is your ability to come to Wentworth dependent on the quality of your high school? Pretty high, right? So if you're going to have children, it matters. What are the school systems like in the areas that you can afford to buy a house in? These are the questions that you, you will be asking uh, for the next few decades. Um, let's say, uh, so one of the options you have is instead of paying off your student loans in 10 years, you can pay twice as much money and pay them off in 30 years because the interest, but that will free up more money for your real estate purchase. And now where can you live? And, and where's this job that you're gonna get 
$55,000. Let's say 10 years from now, you're making $80,000. Where is this job? Or maybe if you're a Wentworth graduate, maybe you're making $100,000. But that job is in Four Point Channel. And where you're living is far enough away that there's a good chance you'll be driving. This is called drive to qualify. You leave the center of the economic, where all the high paying jobs are. You get in your car because that's the only way to get around. And you drive out away from that economic center until you there's a piece of real estate that you can afford that you are willing to purchase. How many of you need to have a backyard for the kids? How many of you, it's just, it's, you know, I, I work hard. I deserve, you deserve, I'm going to have a backyard. How many of you are going to have a good school system for your kids? So you'll be driving a long ways every day, and you'll probably be thinking about these issues, whether you remember this lecture or not. So, yeah, question. Um, it looks like the verdict is in that employers want us to be in person two or three days a week minimum. So yes, it changes it, but it doesn't eliminate it. Um, architecture firms, you guys did a co-op. Are people in the office? Half and half? Okay. So, um, so there's really, there's, there's, there's three levels of this that I want to, I'm walking us through here. One is, what is your, what is your structure and agency look like? Now, keep in mind, you guys are at the top, right? First of all, you're going to college. Second of all, you're going to college in a field that actually, what's Wentworth's tagline? Why, why did you choose Wentworth? Do you know the slogan? What's the key consideration that brings students to Wentworth? Why did we have over 200 freshmen entering this year, last September? Employment rate, it's return on investment. Have you heard that? Wentworth architecture, even though it's not as high paid as the engineering, Wentworth Architecture is one of the highest performing programs in terms of return on investment. It's not crazy to spend a quarter million dollars on an education and expect to get that back within a certain time frame early in your career. Your, uh, the other people you went to high school with, if they went to college, there's a good chance they're spending the same amount or more because other schools cost more than Wentworth. They're spending more for an education that doesn't hold the same, the same financial promise as your education. So as tough as it is for you, it's tougher for most of everyone else in, uh, you went to high school with. So, um, so you're doing okay relative to the others. But is it good enough? Not even close. Some of the things you can do uh, to change, we've just talked about, but the rest has to do with the profession that we're in. The discipline of architecture and urbanism has a lot to do with the changing shape of these structures that either contribute to spreading the benefits or concentrating the benefits. And so this is a crucial consideration in architectural practice. Are the design decisions we're making concentrating the benefits to ever smaller uh, segment of the population or are the decisions, are the design decisions we're making broadening those prospects? Los Angeles, I'm gonna whiz through this because of time. Um, used to be the exception to the rule. Uh, it could just confuse architects. The cities we understood were London, 
New York, Chicago. They were centered and they, they, you know, people were focused on the economic activities at the center of the city. And then they lived as close as they could to that center. And so they were, it was a, it was a single, a monocentric model. Los Angeles was the weird, uh, bizarre exception to that. And architects throughout the 20th century really didn't have a clue as to what was going on in LA. We ignored it. We didn't study it because it really didn't have anything to do with anything. But now it is the norm. It's a polycentric urban formation. Every city in the world is now either forming fresh in this model or moving into that model, uh, Boston included. Boston has multiple uh, focuses of, of design uh, energy. Longwood Medical is one of them. We're in one of the nucleuses uh, of a polynucleic system. So it used to be, this is the classic model of urban formation. And uh, Chicago was the uh, clearest example of that, uh, interrupted by Lake Michigan, but this was the model. But then other things happened. You'll be learning uh, ArcGIS next semester, and this is the kind of modeling that's possible with ArcGIS, and we can start to make sense of things. But what happened in Los Angeles is it formed as multiple cities and towns that then grew together as a connected network. And it's now a poly, polycentric city. And the formation of these centers and disturbances in the patterns have to do with zoning and the formation of neighborhoods and the uh, distribution of opportunities and benefits and amenities and the quality of schools and the quality of housing and the hazards to health. Uh, lead pipes, all of these things are distributed uh, in very discrete pockets because of the forces of history to the point where we looked last week at uh, the splintered urbanism of these bundled uh, luxury nodes that were then. Yes. I had a question on the last slide. Uh, so you mentioned how like the number one should be like the most expensive place and then everybody should be trying to make the system number one as possible. Uh, but like, why would Little Sicily and Chinatown, which is particularly great up in America, why would they be so close to the city center if they should have a location? It has to do with uh, external forces that disrupt the smoothness of this pattern. And uh, it might be the school systems, it might be race, it might be quality of infrastructure, it might be noise, it might be a freeway cuts through there. It might be that the forces of gentrification have not yet worked their, their, their magic of displacing whole communities. But that is happening and has happened in Chicago. Um, and the reading about Los Angeles, there are certain zones that are abandoned and homelessness is accommodated in some locations, even though they're very close to the center. So there's a general model of the smooth transition, and then there are zones of exception. And those zones of exception are the result of multiple forces. I'm gonna zoom through this and get to a specific zone of exception uh, that results in, this is a, a racial distribution map in Los Angeles that corresponds with, uh, with redlining. So I'm gonna quickly move through the security apparatuses of, of architecture and, and get to the issues of zoning. You, this was a slide you saw in history theory two uh, we're just reminding you that zoning at one point when there was an industrial city, there was a logic to zoning. Put the industrial uh, smokestacks uh, upwind from the city so you don't have the smokestacks, you don't have the smog blowing to the city. It's important to separate those two things. 
But the idea of zoning under the uh, guise of uh, functions of Corbusier and the Congress, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, they said there's four functions in a good city, dwelling, work, recreation, and then the transportation infrastructure to get between those zones. And the more separate those zones are, the more space and the more important the transportation is. Next week, we'll talk about that. But then something else happened, and it is, uh, it is redlining. And I'm, so I'm going to jump past uh, the Civil War. There was a brief moment for about uh, 10 years when the human rights were granted to the formerly enslaved population of the South, but because of a contested election in 1877, that project of restoration of the rights of formerly enslaved uh, humans was stopped in 1877. And it wasn't until 100 years later that it picked up again. Um, the Tulsa, June 1st, we're going to be celebrating the or commemorating the anniversary of the Tulsa uh, Greenwood District, the Tulsa Massacre. Um, X-Men, have you seen that? The X-Men? They, they reenacted the beginning of that series, which is a pretty powerful uh, reenactment of that. Um, so this book changed a lot of things for architects, for architecture. You're not going to look at that. Let's look at this. Sorry about that. That, of course, is Chris Rock's famous joke about streets named for Martin Luther King Jr., which tend to be in, let's say, distressed areas. And he's not wrong, because if you look at where we house segregation works in America, you can see how things ended up in school. Once you see it, you won't be able to see it. Okay, let's look at MLK Boulevard in Baltimore. I want to show you how to see housing segregation in schools, in health, in family wealth, in policing. But first, an explanatory comment. It's the 1930s when we get a great election at the RT president. He wants to bring economic relief to millions of Americans through a collection of federal programs and projects called DEAL. One part of that new deal was the National Housing Act. He introduced ideas like the delivery of mortgage and low fixed interest rates. So now you have all these lower income people can afford homes, but how do you make sure they don't default on their new mortgages? And certainly, homeowners and your corporation. HOLC created residential security maps, and these maps, they're where the term red lighting comes from. Green meant best area. Good people like white collar green. Yellow men in the declining area of the working class families, and red men detrimental influences, hazardous by foreign born people, low class whites, and most significantly, Negroes. Again and again, on these HLC maps, one of the most consistent criteria for redlining neighborhoods is the presence of black and brown people. Let's be clear studies show that people who live in redlined areas were not necessarily more likely to default on their mortgages. But redlining made it difficult, if not impossible, to buy or refinance. So landlords abandon their property, city services become unviable, in most places, crime increases, and property values drop. All of these conditions fester for 30 years as white people lead to the brand new suburbs popping up all over the country. Many of those suburbs institute rules called covenants that explicitly forbid selling homes to black people. And all of this was perfectly painful. Yeah. Now it's 1968, and MLK is assassinated. Good evening. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, pretty hostile of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shocked that the king is shot and is killed tonight. In the aftermath, Congress passed the Fair Housing Act of 1968, a policy meant to encourage equal housing opportunities regardless of race, the gender, national origin, 
and it offers protection for future hope for sprinters, but it does little to fix the damage already done. Over the next 50 years, the Fair Housing Act is rarely enforced. So you can still see housing segregation and its effects in Baltimore, and often along any other part in any US city, like its effects on wealth. So home ownership is the major way Americans create wealth, right? Well, discrimination in housing is the major reason that Black families, up and down the income scale, have a tiny fraction of the family wealth that white families do. Even white families with less education and lower incomes. For almost 30 years, 98% of FHA loans were handed out to white farmers. Not only were Black neighborhoods redlined, and not only was the Fair Housing Act selectively enforced, if at all, but it is still today much harder for a Black person to get a mortgage or home loan than it is for a white person. Families are fearful of speaking up about a basic human right that should be afforded to everyone in the world, definitely in the richest country in the world. And housing segregation in schools. The primary way that Americans pay for public schools is by paying property taxes. People who live in more valuable homes have better funded local schools. So this is better key. School facilities and more resources. Here's a feedback. The this better the schools in the neighborhood, the more those homes in that neighborhood, and the higher there is for schools, and so on and so on. And housing segregation in health. So the US is the only country in the world that finances its school systems through local property taxes. And the reason this system is tolerated and sustained is because it permits a very different outcome for towns right next to each other, depending on the value of the properties. So uh, the wealthy suburbs of the coast of Connecticut uh, that you've heard of, Greenwich, Darien, New Canaan, uh, Westport, Milford, those are the wealthy towns. And between each of those, there are towns with much poorer school systems Stamford, Norwalk, Bridgeport. And this is a very strange thing in the modern world where local property taxes funding schools creates a huge discrepancy in the quality of outcomes. And this is in large part the legacy of redlining. And this is another film that uh, covers, deals with these things in terms of wealth accumulation. Just over 150 years ago, this was lower for almost half of America. On multiple bills were people picking cotton. Enslaved people. These slaves didn't just represent wealth in America. It worked. By 1863, they were worth over three billion dollars. Since then, America has slowly, painfully transformed this country, breaking down racial barriers. I'm very optimistic about the future. By the way, I have seen certain changes in the United States that surprise and So, on the basis of this, I think it became the input. Wealth is different. White family in the African American right smack jazz. So uh, this is a key takeaway thing. Look up from your screens for a moment at this slide. I'm seeing lots and lots of eyes. Virginia. Um, and maybe open your eyes. But the average white family household wealth is somewhere around 10 times the level of the average black family. And that is true today and it's getting, it's actually deepening, it's not improving in a lot of places. And so wealth is different than human rights, uh, equal, equal 
rights, equal access to housing is great. We could change everything tomorrow. And this would not change. This would take decades to change. So this is, is the case for reparations. And this is what architecture and urbanism can do. It can alter the distribution of opportunities such that this gap can start to close. The median White House looks wrong. Their savings, assets, minus their debts, is $171,000. The median Black households is $17,600. And that gap is still growing. It grown. Why? So we don't have time for all of this. But I recommend it highly uh, if you could take it in uh, between now and Tuesday, I think it would be great. Um, the, these maps uh, that show uh, racial uh, segregation are, are fairly recent 2010 census data and things even with uh, the civil rights movement of, and the new laws of the 1960s, uh, housing segregation and school segregation has continued to deepen. It has not gotten better, it's actually gotten worse. And one of the questions we ask every year uh, around this lecture is who should be in this classroom who is not sitting here next to you? And the people who have been left out of the opportunities for wealth accumulation. As bad as it looks for your prospects to buy a home, consider what it, the prospects are for other people who do not have the benefit of a Wentworth architectural degree. And then think about those who do not have the family wealth. Because even when you qualify for a mortgage, you still have to come up with a down payment. It used to be 20% of the cost of the house. Uh, it's been eased to be 10% of the cost of the house, and there are programs for first-time homeowners uh, for 5%. So even if you're getting a 5% down payment as a first-time home buyer, and you're buying a house for $600,000, should you be so lucky? Congratulations. But now we need $30,000 for your down payment. Where does that $30,000 come from? It comes from, typically, the American way has been it comes from family wealth. Individual performance may vary, of course. Uh, people's agency has a big influence on the outcomes, but so does the structure. And the structural systemic arrangements of the United States have uh, targeted uh, brown and black families differently than the rest. And that's kind of the punchline that we'll just take in in this last film clip. It would lower the racial top gap subtly. And maybe not even that much. The Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis did a study that came up with the finding that white college graduates over a couple of decades, their wealth increased dramatically. As one might expect, black college graduates over the same period of time, their wealth actually increased. The reason isn't that graduates make very different amounts of money. It was how they spend it. It's much more likely to be the case 
that an African American college graduate is the most successful in their family network, and therefore relatives ask them for help and they give it. That doesn't mean that white college graduates are less charitable or less giving or anything like that. It just means that they're like others in their network. African Americans were for 246 years. For 100 more years, a patchwork of laws excluded them from building law, and discrimination continues today. The wealth gap has grown so large over so many years, it would take something truly round to close. How can you close this gap, this huge gap in wealth between whites and blacks? Right. How much have we talked about here, Thomas? Well, we don't actually know. I will tell you the check. Yeah. Is anyone on the stage for reparation for slavery for African Americans? Are you? Bible says we shall be and must be repairs to grief. And a breach has occurred. We have to acknowledge that. This does have a generation of wants to just can't hold it. This is something that started with slavery, but it's never diminished over time. And that's because government policy keeps perpetuating circumstances where the wealth gap. I mean, it's the Billy Holiday song, right? Then that's God shall have, and that's not shall lose. It, it is truly self perpetuating Remember this issue of compensatory, of preferential treatment. Negro is raised. Some of our friends will toil and part. The Negro should be granted equality. They agree. She asked for nothing. On the surface, this appears reasonable, but it is not realistic. For it's obvious if a man enters and starts on a race three hundred years after another man, the first would have to perform some incredible feat in order to catch up to his fellow brother. Okay. And the slides uh, show some data uh, on median indicators and then the racial distribution uh, by city. Um, so there's some important data here that is available in the slides that we just don't have time to take in. Uh, so that's that. And so we move on. Yours. <clears throat> and you're doing slides, so we can just keep it here, right? We can give it there, yeah. That's perfect, yeah. yeah. So guys. So Robert was explaining us the Complex structural system that we use in inequality. So, and I, I want to take one phrase the difference between segregating the wealth versus concentrating the wealth. So, what, 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 is, what I'm trying to do today is has a more, let's say, optimistic perspective, perspective and discuss. What are the tools that we as an architect have in order to improve the urban built environment, in order to improve the society? So, so what are the tools that we have? And I, and I want your attention because I will propose four tools that exist, that already exist. And I want your critiques about these tools. So, because Sometimes we discuss that they are not enough or they could be misused. So my last five fragments of this lecture has four different tools that we have as an architect to improve equality. And finally, one, one slide that, that asks us what else we can do. So I want your contribution today, hope that we can do it in criticizing these tools and in addition to that to discuss a little bit what else we can do if something we can do so so because we are architects one of the things that happened with architecture is that we are optimistic we cannot be an architect without being optimistic so because we want we believe 
that with our project, we can improve the world. So currently there are always happening different projects. You know that uh, this space was very recently renovated. The project just started five, four years ago by Sasaki. And it's, it's an amazing project that basically build infrastructure around the, around the city hall. And these are, you can, you can visit this place. Are you visit that place, place recently? It's recently renovated. So, and these are the original plan. But then what I'm trying to say is that we as an architect, we create infrastructure. This is our role in the society. We create infrastructure. So my, the question that I want to open here is what, how this infrastructure that is happening everywhere helps or not helps to the concentration of, 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 of wealth or, the, or to the segregation of wealth. So how our, our infrastructure contributes or not to this binary question that, that, that Robert is asking us is how we can contribute or not with our infrastructure to improve the society. So because what is what is true is that when we create infrastructure, it happens to what, what we call for, we, we just talk about agglomeration economy. I'm coming back to the discussion that we had we were talking about the right of the city. Do you remember that? So the agglomeration economy is saying basically that you can agglomerate uh, and you can match different opportunities in different parts and we do infrastructure to do this and we have matching learning uh, sharing and learning process that create clusters of development but that comes with the risk also which is great the one the one amazing thing of infrastructure is that the that through the infrastructure you can produce capital gains and creativity in the society and when you create creativity that produces also um, Capital gain. So every time that you put infrastructure, the land of the value increases. And not only the land of the value increases, but also the opportunities of people to share their knowledge and to and thrive themselves in this particular place also increase. So I'm very, 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 very optimistic in saying that our infrastructure can produce our economies of collaboration that improve the society in one particular place. But be careful. Remember, we say two weeks ago, we're discussing about the right of the city is when you have a collaboration of economies, if there is a person that doesn't match with that particular agglomeration, that would be segregated. So our infrastructure is also a possibility or a or a or, or a forms that can produce segregation. So what I'm trying to explain, and this is basically the core of the whole lecture, is how we can use, understand the value of our infrastructure, the things that we produce in the society, a good building, a nice plaza, a great corridor, a new park, a new corridor, everything that we produce creates, increase the value of the land. So how we can use this fact to capture a certain fragment of this value to basically uh, redistribute the wealth or concentrate more the wealth for everybody. So this is a video that explains, this is a video about the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. It's, a, it's an organization based in Cambridge, close to here. And, and they are basically always thinking ways to use uh, planning tools uh, as a form of, of, of produce more equality. So let's listen, this is a long video, but that explains everything. What does a community need to thrive? What are the features of a place that enable people to live their lives, to go to work, to raise a family, to engage with others? Underlying these daily activities is the backbone that makes a thriving community possible, public infrastructure. The water coming out of the tap, the sword that carries our waste, the electricity that lights our homes, the network of roads, sidewalks, and trains that connect us to each other. Almost everything we do relies on infrastructure, which is why in many places throughout the world, infrastructure is seen as a public good. But the public sector constantly struggles to pay for these essential and often expensive features of everyday life. Many communities lack basic infrastructure and others face a backlog of repairs. Experts project the governments around the world will need to invest more than $50 trillion in infrastructure by 2030. Where can the public turn to pay for this? 
Land value capture, also known as land value return, is an approach governments can use to finance expensive infrastructure projects and other public services without drawing from their general budget. Instead, they can initiate public actions that help to pay for them. You see, some kinds of public actions, like infrastructure investment or land use changes, can directly cause an increase in the value of land in a specific area. Typically, those increases in wealth go directly into the pockets of a few lucky landowners. This is inherently unfair because collective decisions and sometimes public money are directly creating an unearned windfall for a small number of people. And in a time of tight budgets and exploding need for public services, these windfalls to private landowners represent an enormous missed opportunity. Imagine if even a fraction of the land values generated by these public actions could be recovered and reinvested in a way that benefits everyone. This is where land value capture comes in. And the principle behind land value capture is that public action should generate public benefit. By utilizing different land value capture strategies, governments can trigger increases in land values and funnel that wealth into the public services that enable their communities to thrive. Okay, let's break this down. To use land value capture, a government first has to initiate an action that will increase land values. The two main kinds of public actions a government can take to do this are investments in infrastructure and land use changes. How do these actions influence land values? Let's look at infrastructure investments first. When you think about it, Infrastructure has a lot to do with how desirable a location is to live, work, and run a business. And location is what matters most in the real estate market, determining the value of land. Just imagine this same building in a place with no public infrastructure at all. Who would want to live there? It would be practically worthless. The impact of public investments in infrastructure on land values adds up to a lot of money. Researchers have been able to measure this around specific projects. One study looked at the construction of a mass transit line in Manila, Philippines, an important metro line in the city, which was completed in the year 2000, and cost the city $655 million to build. Researchers looked at the value of land within a kilometer of each stop on the new subway line, compared it to the value of land more than two kilometers away from the stations. By tracking real estate prices in these two groups over time, before, during, and after construction, they were able to see that the land close to the transit stations increased in value far more than the land further away. The researchers estimated that in total, the land within one kilometer of the transit station gained close to $3.4 billion in value as a direct result of the MRT reload. Did you catch that? The increased value of property generated by the new subway line was roughly five times the cost of the project. Manila is not an isolated case. The 2017 Q-Line extension in New York City generated $7.1 billion in land value, compared with the construction cost of $4.5 billion. In the San Francisco Bay Area, a new Warm Springs South Fremont station created $2.8 billion in land value, compared with an $802 million construction cost. And it's not just transit. Similar effects can be found with projects like the rehabilitation of a stream, flood control, and revitalization of public spaces. These are all examples of how infrastructure investments increase land values. The other way governments can trigger increases in land values are through certain changes in land use regulations. One of the most common ways this happens is when the government changes the zoning to allow more dense development. As populations grow, it's common for governments to allow bigger, taller buildings in more places. If the land is adequately serviced and demand is high, changing the zoning to allow new development can make the land in those places more valuable. This is because developers can profit from building larger buildings and selling more units. These kinds of zoning changes can generate a lot of money. For example, the municipality of Valle du Mar, Colombia regulates land use by designating some land as rural, which is reserved for open space and farmland, and other land as urban, which allows for more density. 
When the government rezoned a plot of land at the periphery of the city from rural to urban to enable a new development project, the effective value of the parcel increased by the equivalent of 42 million in US dollars. More than five and a half times the value it was before, just because the government changed the zone. By a two part is not an outlier. In fact, in cities throughout the world, urban analysts have found that such rezonings can generate an appreciation of land value of up to 600%, depending on local market conditions. In all of these examples, public action, which could be infrastructure investments or land use changes, triggered an increase in land values. But who ultimately benefited from those actions? The folks who owned the land whose own efforts had nothing to do with their newfound wealth? What if even a portion of those government-generated increases in wealth were redirected back into the community to pay for things that benefit everyone? Within the Land Value Capture Toolkit, there are lots of options governments can utilize to help fulfill the unique needs and challenges of their communities. Different versions of land value capture have been used in cities all over the world. Take Manizales, Colombia, which has a mountainous topography, making it difficult and expensive, but very necessary to build roads. The city knew that building the roads would increase the accessibility and safety of private land along the new roads, and thus would increase the value of that land. So they decided to use a land value capture instrument called Betterment Contributions. Betterment Contributions are a fee paid by landowners in a designated area who would benefit from an infrastructure project. In Manizales, the fee was calculated by taking into account the cost of the new roads, the value added to the properties by the project, and the capacity of the landowners to pay. Through Betterment contributions, Manizales raised $24.6 million in U.S. dollars for the roads and other urban revitalization projects. Betterment contributions are used widely in Colombia, and survey data shows high levels of satisfaction among property owners and residents in Manizales. Just like Money Salis was able to recover and reinvest the value added of their infrastructure investments through betterment contributions, the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts has been able to recover the value added of land use changes to reinvest in affordable housing. This instrument is called inclusionary housing. Cambridge, Massachusetts is home to elite universities and a flourishing tech and biomedical industry. It's also one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. The city needed more affordable housing, and they knew that increasing the allowable density would make land more valuable. So they decided to use a land value capture tool called inclusionary housing. Under the city of Cambridge's inclusionary housing program, developers are allowed to build larger residential buildings only if 20% of the port area is dedicated to affordable housing. Cambridge's affordable housing law has created more than 1,000 units of affordable rental and ownership housing in new developments throughout the city. These affordable homes provide a crucial housing opportunity for many residents in the community, and developers are willing to pay for them because the value created by the zoning changes more than makes up for the cost of providing the affordable units. Betterment contributions in Manizales, Colombia, and inclusionary housing in Cambridge, Massachusetts are just two examples from a wealth of experiences with land value capture across the world. The land value capture toolbox is full of options, each with its own context, advantages, and considerations. Land adjustment in Tokyo, Japan, the selling of development rights in Sao Paulo, Brazil, exactions in Cordoba, Argentina, transfer of development rights in Pennsylvania, the US, these instruments and more play a crucial role in helping governments throughout the world finance the needs of their communities. Are infrastructure investments and land use changes happening in your neighborhood? If so, how might the land value capture toolbox help your community pay for the public goods and services you rely on? Any questions so far? Any comments about this? Yeah. What does it? It was saying that if you increase the, like the value of the own stuff like that in the area that you're expecting, um, for a ticket, that's gonna get 
fact that we don't do like property tax is really kind of highly direct. So, yeah, these people are saying that, that it's a fact that if you increase the infrastructure in a certain area, the land of the value will increase. That is a fact. And if the government does, if the government doesn't do the integration, that will happen. So you can have a negotiation with the owners of these lands saying, I will help you, I, I will, that you will increase your wealth because of this integration. So let's share in certain percentage this, this increase of money. So that doesn't mean speak. there are many, many tools. One is property taxes. That is one of them. That is the most traditional one to say. But they are produce, proposing other, other strategies. And then the tax reason because they call that a tool key or toolbox of, 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 of alternatives. Actually, I will, I'm, I'm going to talk about four of them later in my presentation. But yes, so basically you are suggesting that if you are, if because of this infrastructure that I am putting them close to your land, your, your, your land will cost not 100, but 500. So let's negotiate if you, if you, if you return a fraction of this to other information. Because if not, you won't have this information. So it's a basically, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, so now I'll just share across the table. Yes. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. And property taxes are so low relative to the right. increase that's in that. That's the because the uh, property tax is 3%? I don't remember. Well, as homeowners in the city of Cambridge, <clears throat> our property taxes are so low. It's really low, yeah. Really low. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous uh, for, for, the, for, for the cost of the all of our part. So, property taxes is a form of. But, but again, so you have to imagine that. Because of the land infrastructure of the new public infrastructure, you can re-imagine, revitalize, also redevelop this area. So this redevelopment will come with certain benefits. Let's share that part of the uh, of, of, of the benefit. Because if yeah, if, because if my government does not need to recover, that benefit won't happen at all. Yeah. So so my point here is that yeah, we have an uh, 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 several tools like the infrastructure that we say you can have rezoning of certain areas, you can have urban maps, and all of them are basically tools. So I want to make it a, par a parenthesis here to discuss a little bit that we as an architect, as an urban designers in this case, we have several tools to do our projects. So I need to show you the traditional design instruments that we have as an urban designers. Uh, to develop our ideas in the city or to reimagine the city in certain ways. These design instruments are basically tools. They do not produce good or bad seeds. It's the same thing that a plan or a section comes. Or a section or an elevation. We draw a plan, the plan has the floor plan have to be well drawn. That doesn't mean that the architect is good or is doing the one that you just want to do. It's basically a tool that you use to reimagine uh, the city. So it's my it's our responsibility in this class to show some of these tools. These are the traditional one. I'm gonna jump. So you have this presentation. I'm gonna uh, go really quick to them because I want them to go to the more inclusionary design instruments uh, that that, uh, that that help us to discuss this possibility of of concentration of redistribution the values. So in architecture, sorry, in urban design we have. We can do urban frameworks. Actually, you will do these design framework in Studio 7 next semester. So imagine that you have a three-dimensional uh, um, uh, re uh, layout of the city where you highlight the most important infrastructure that you produce to create certain urban networks. This is an urban framework. Please do not confuse the design framework with the master plan. It's different. A master plan is a set of documents that have to be approved and uh, by 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 the legislature. So basically, this is a framework where you imagine what are the type of infrastructure that you can have in a city in order to improve its connectivity or to increase the amount of public space or whatever strategy that you have. Second, we have master plans. Master plans are more comprehensive. So, and the big difference between the urban frameworks and master plans 
is that all run framework who's really focused more in the public, where master plans focuses in the public plus the uh, sonification, the, uh, the, the regulation of the private. So this master plan is more comprehensive and includes also, as you see here, how the private, so the parcels can be re-densified, for example, uh, in order to create certain urban conditions like this. So what you imagine not only the public, but how the building should respond in order to have uh, um, 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 uh, a, a better uh, layout and a better landscape or, and, and downscape for the city. So third, so we, we usually, uh, in, in, the, another tool that we have as designer is the quality programs. The quality programs is, are a little more strategic in the way that that includes the analysis of the economics, the such, the, the vulnerability and the and the and the, soci and the sociological conditions of the city, and try to imagine how you can have different strategies, interventions that contribute with the urban. So you can imagine that in, in, a, in so while the previous one are more spatial or physical, here the quality programs are more other things, other strategies that you can have like new uh, educational programs or like new regulations that helps you to improve also the socioeconomic of the city and to reduce vulnerability. So following the previous two, we also do design codes. This is one that I really love in Florida so that you can regulate different types of, in, in vertical, you have different types of, 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 of treatment of the parcels. And then you and you regulate how you the dimension that you can have in the yard, the porch, the balcony, in the parking, and the height, in order to create certain parameters that create a um, a more um, comprehensive view of, of of the scene. So, and the sign codes are usually with a lot of documents that explain sometimes in high level of detail what the Jew can build or what art the architects can build in a specific plot of the of the city. So we have side briefs. Side briefs are more for a specific area that you want to redevelop or you want to reimagine. Like for example, in one specific district that you can create a specific strategic plan to, to reinvigorate that particular area. One, one very uh, uh, common one are the business improvement districts are really common. So now in Central Square in, in Cambridge, they're having a, a business improvement district. So they are creating a brief about what they can do in order to uh, uh, um, impulse the, 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 the improvement of this particular area through different interventions. Sometimes that includes public spaces, new infrastructure, but also uh, new uh, economic agreements, and new plans to introduce more home ownership uh, or, or, and so on. So you can introduce a lot of a, a specific strategies for a, for a specific site. And questions? Uh, yeah? yeah, I'm I sorry. Was, I was just going to ask. Uh, is it uh, our studio project formatted? In, in the studios, which studio? Sorry. Yeah, is it? Uh, no, not necessarily because because Studio Six is you are when 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 we talk when we talk site in the or in our design is not a plot. It's, it's it's an area. And the limits of the area is basically the most difficult part to define inside briefs are what are the limits of the area. So but it's not a site, not a specific plot, not a parcel, but a, for a systems of public area. That could be improved with certain terrain. A business improvement is for me and better example. It's a role of example. Business improvement. Architects are good architects. They look at the area, they produce their own site brief, really. No. So explain to us what 
how do I qualify for one of those 15 percent, 15 percent of the units? Yeah, Somerville. Or a big income, depending on the area. And then they put the that in the pool, and when the building opens, they, they can assign you. And there is a, a system of points. If you have kids, you have four points that you have that you don't. If you have uh, a, 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 a lower education, or points, they have a system of points, and they assign you. But for sure, the offer of, of affordable housing through inclusionary housing is not enough to cover the amount of people that are in. But don't I need to be around eighty percent of the median? It, 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 I, 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 I know that you're expecting that answer, but that depends on the, of the game. But commonly, yes. Yeah. So when I applied for housing in Boston, they told me I didn't qualify unless I made uh, around eighty percent less. Yeah. Well, actually, Manuel's house we needed to sell it. They, uh, it was a. a it was the inclusionary zoning requirement that the person, he was afraid he couldn't buy it because uh, he couldn't sell it. because no one qualified by the government rules and could still get a loan. Yeah, and also there is a cultural issue because if you're married, then you, your home, uh, your income increase. So it's, it's a very tricky, tricky problem. Yeah, yeah, uh, very easy. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, the problem with income based housing is they sterilize communities don't want to be able to afford to move out of the income based housing because if your income increases, you know, yeah, that's a good point. So, like so the point is that these units, the ones that are affordable, will remain as affordable forever. So, and there are certain differences. Sometimes you are rented. So these basically the, the your landlord is the government and you have to pay affordable rents to the government to the government. And sometimes you can buy them, but for certain under the rule that you cannot sell that unless you have this that you sell that as an affordable. Which is good because you can uh, keep the, the stock of affordable housing in the city. But she's right. So you have uh, certain regulations year by year. And if you succeed and you thrive, you have to get a better job. Sometimes you can kick out your home because because now you have to come buy a rent apartment house. Again, that changes the value of the city, but that that is we can assume that is a, a general rule. So that, that is the counter effect of this. So my wife works in, as a social worker working with uh, with people trying to find affordable housing, and you find several people, especially immigrants, that they don't want to they don't want to have good jobs. Because they know that sometimes there is a moment that you overpass this threshold, it will be very, much more difficult for you to enter the, in the complicated market day, market uh, rate housing. So you prefer not to have that money to still have the opportunity to have affordable housing. That's, uh, yeah, uh, period. I just have a question. Are you going to be able to get a loan from the government to buy a Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in the case of the only door, they design with poor materials and, and with poor materials and 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 uh, and, and, and less equipped uh, um, houses in the in the other previous one. The one. In a separate so, door. Sorry. In a separate door in the backyard, actually. Not in the front of the building. So if you have no relation, you can also discriminate through that too, for sure. For sure. So so the idea that because the concept behind this is that you are connected with everyone and you believe in your capacity in capacity of everyone to thrive because you are in connection with others, you are in certain use. But if that doesn't happen because the you know, we know that the buildings we can segregate, we can have two buildings into one. 
if we do not do an architecture, it's not regulated architecture that uses this uh, conjunction of, of, of force between different socioeconomic styles that 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 could also, could also produce uh, discrimination for sure. So so we have four more. Uh, and the discussion is quite good. What do we could do? This is another one, and you can do the rest one. Yeah. We covered this one. Right? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So um, so let's let's do another one that's li 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 that is linkage fee. Yeah, it's actually interesting that uh, if we built like that today, that would be considered very, very positive, progressive, and inclusionary design. Because it's one entrance, and the rich person living on the second floor insists that it's a beautiful entrance. So it's a beautiful entrance for everyone in the building, no matter how poor they are, even if the stairway got there. So if you don't mind, let me move forward. I gotta skip the videos. You have the video, they are very, very, very well screened. And I think this is something that we have to go with. I need to look at them. But I'm going to move to October. All, all the slides explaining each instrument briefly, but they will have all have the same issue that you can use these you can use these instruments to to produce uh, inclusionary environments, but also can you can game the system and use that at your benefits if you if you want. So the second one is linkage fee. Linkage fee fees is much more straightforward. Actually, it doesn't need to, it's not related to design. It says that if I produce an infrastructure, GI government can have a fee that I that you have to pay me, the developer has to pay me, and I will use this money for infrastructure. So it's more straight. Every single project uh, that is in certain districts, even if it's not housing. That you do a shopping mall, and it, because of my infrastructure, you can do an amazing, huge shopping mall. I can I can decide that certain person that should in this area I will use that in a in a in a bucket that I will use, for example, for inclusionary housing or for or for or for public space or other infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. So and this very is 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 better explained in the in the in, in the video. So the next one is overlay districts. Over overlay district is basically you have the ability within, within the governments to overlay the zoning of certain districts to change that for the company. So and this uh, the, the, the there is a good example that you can see in the video. But imagine that you say. You want to present, and this is basically used for other tools, not only for inventory house or for a rural house. You can imagine, imagine that you want to preserve central district for historic reasons, and you overlay a sony with another sony that includes other tools. So this is another tool that we have to put and then to, to readjust or adjust certain fragment of the team. So what is happening now that used to be used for preservation, but it's now used only also to, to improve or to increase the amount of affordability. And I, I want to move forward because I will have one critique at the end that I want to, I, I, I want to share to you. And finally, uh, is, is the community land trust. So I I insist you to look at the video. And one of the one of the best examples of inclusionary housing was by these amazing teams led by John Davis, the book that we have in the readings was about this guy. There was a, 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 a revolutionary guy who was a visionary club to create great community land trust in, in Vermont. So community land trust basically what says that 
we have these particular imagine that you have this block and each chair is a house. So when you so the the you own the property of the house, but you, you do not own the property of the land. The land is owned by our, us as an organization, a community trust. So we create a community land trust and all of us share the property of the land and we own the property of, of, of the unit. What are the benefits of this one? What are the benefits? First, it's much more difficult for a developer to come here and to own buy your house to, uh, to gentrify it. Because it's much more easy to agree with them to buy this house than to agree with everyone to buy the house. To buy the house. But, so it's, it, it, it's highly demonstrated that community land trusts are producing, are reducing gentrification. But there is another tool that is used in Spain, not in America, that I think could be, uh, it's an opportunity. Imagine that, so you have this plot of land and these are houses. And, and each plot have a, a single unit. And suddenly you have a street here that you want to connect with this street. So, and you need to negotiate the relocation of this set of houses in order to contribute, continue this street for the benefit of everyone. So in this space, it's really common to have community land trust because it's much more easy for this guy to sell or this or to negotiate this property for the project because he's not losing 100 percent of their land but 10 percent of their of their property but we all together work for the benefit of this of this of this project so in any case uh, I, I invite you to look at to look at these examples and to ask yourself what else what else we can do there is only one critique that i have today about this strategy these strategies are extremely focused in housing, which is important, but it's not enough. So we know that the city could be better. We have, for example, more. We were discussing public space. We were discussing schools, better schools for. We were discussing to have better parks, better forms of transportation, better forms of transportation. Everything that we were imagining, we have imagined so far about inclusionary, has to do with housing. I think the world is demanding from you other instruments, other, other design ideas that they can address other fragments of the city. But also. So, yeah, we are all set for today. <laughs>